Okay, good. Just making sure. Yes, I'm recording. So welcome to the No Place Left Gen Z um, shop. And I want to, I just want to share with you really quick. Um, we're going to talk and I would love for you all to talk some with each other. Probably something that we're missing this year is the ability to like just have all the great downtime meeting others in this work and networking together. And so we're going to make some time to do that. We'll probably break out into like a few breakout rooms and just kind of quick discuss and process. But I want to share with you partly why I felt like this needed to be a breakout. Um, the context for my ministry right now is I'm co-vocational. I, I like to do uh, church planning. <laughs> and so I'm a church planner uh, in Anderson, South Carolina. It's a small fellowship of believers with big impact. Our, we're aiming for no place left in Anderson County. We want to start where the, we don't think the gospel is going, which is apartments, low income apartments in our city. And um, that's been really been our focus really the last two years. But around four years ago, uh, I joined a ministry called Clayton King Ministries that's in Anderson. And during that time, we interact with hundreds of churches a year. Um, I speak and recruit and train. And in that time, I have seen thousands and thousands and thousands of young people respond to the gospel in just four years through, there's been gospel events, there's been trainings at churches, there's been sermons, there's been, you know, peers going out. And I have just seen incredible fruit among young people. But there's a concerning thing that we should all be talking about constantly. And that's this number that I want you to remember. And the number is 80%. Say it with me. 80%. 80% of young people are walking away from the faith not to return the day they turn 18. I want you to think about that. Around 80%. I don't care how good of a youth pastor you are. I don't care. You know, that is everyone. That, that is across the board. That's the data. Um, that's going to great churches. That's having believing parents. They're, this data is super, super concerning. And so... There's this other thing that's going on too, which is the same number. 80% of kids are likely to pray to receive Christ between the age of four and 14. Isn't that amazing? 80%. So um, I, I want to make a confession. As a youth, I was a youth pastor for four years. I'm actually in the old church office right now that I used to um, work in in South Florida right now. And uh, literally, I was just passionate about you know my task was middle school high school students and that was the world i was in and it's the world i'm in now i see high school students college students um you know middle age students and we would see them come to faith really in droves but you know then i would see them pray to receive christ again and again and again four five six seven times a lot of you probably have that story if you were raised in church you know 99 percent certain and you know, 1% worried you're going to hell. You know, that was me. And what I'm noticing is that what about these other faiths that are doing it better? Jefferson Bethke said this great stat. Listen to this. Um, the Jewish faith and the Amish faith retain 95% of their young people. I want you to think about that. 95%. And here's why. This is why there's seven, you know, what, what's we, lose, we keep 20, they keep 95. And this is what he said. It's so rare for an Amish young person to walk away from their faith that when they do, they make a TV show about it, right, for perspective. And he said, what is in common between the Jewish faith and the Amish faith? What is a common pattern here? And here's a couple patterns that I just want to bring out. The, one of the first patterns was this. Their father is the leader of that home spiritually. The father is having literally every night a Bible on their dining room table, asking questions about the Bible, teaching their children from a young age that the Bible can handle any question. They have a connection to their history, either through a martyr book or the Old Testament. They have a deep celebratory pattern of celebrating every major feast, every major festival in the home is the primary place, the living room, the dining room table. They're teaching them prayers. They're teaching them the celebrations. They're teaching them the pattern. And that context right there, the family unit, the father, the Bible, the supremacy of the house um, is what makes them be, have such rich community 
and a rich mission and really a rich attachment um, to their family, which we don't have anymore because we've, you know, in many places divided the family and we're trying to get that back. And now we're all sent home to our families, right? <laughs> we are all sent home to our families. And, um, and so we're talking about, you know, winning that next generation to Christ. And as a no place left person, if you've been around any of us for any amount of time, then you've been to a training. You were trained in the three circles. You were trained in your story. And then you were sent out probably that same day, um, which is the best training. I just want to double stamp it. That's the best training you can possibly do is to show them what to do and then go do it. Um, the, the, I would say the battlefield is a better teacher than the classroom. But sometimes I know some people that just take people out. Carter, who's on this call, he started just taking people out. And then if they came, he would teach them in the classroom setting. If they didn't do that, he wouldn't spend the time in the classroom and just ended up saving himself a lot of time with people that never really intended to really live after this or go hard after this. I have learned that that is perfect. Um, I want to so I my job part of my job is to invest in pastors and youth pastors. Some of them were on this call, and uh, some of them I get into a lot of trouble, but that's okay. Um, but I started realizing that that being out and we've heard you've heard this this morning being out in the harvest. What does that mean? It means going out to share the gospel, looking for people that are far from God. A lot of people have never done that, and a lot of pastors haven't done that in a while. So don't assume anything from anyone. And, and well, starting to do that, I finally started to see my disciples make disciples. So I'm not sure where you are at in that story. And it's something I'm going to talk about tomorrow. But I would encourage you to write this question down. Probably the greatest question I can give you in regards to disciple. Can y'all still hear Josh? No. no. <laughs> Drop off. Maybe. That was quite a debate. Say this is the most important question, then you go blank. Uh, I know. <laughs> a little bit of spiritual warfare here. Or is he just sitting there very still to confuse all of us? Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> He's still talking and he doesn't know he's off. Anybody got his WhatsApp or something? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll WhatsApp him real quick. Give me one second, okay? It's good to see you, Burke. How are you doing? I can take some John Williams. Uh, I'm doing very well. Hey, Bert, how are you? Hey, while, while we're waiting for Josh, I believe he'll jump back on. Um, you know, just watching Josh for the last three years um, at a distance. Uh, he said he joined Clayton King Ministries and they run a youth camp every summer that has three to 4,000 uh, students. Wow. Uh, Josh just said his internet died, so he'll be on here in a couple of seconds. Um, and um, so... Over the last three years, he's literally probably trained about 10,000 people in these basic steps he's talking about. So entering the harvest, sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel on their social media, sharing the gospel on their Instagram, their TikTok, and has uh, really seen um, incredible fruit through that, especially among the Gen Z. Um, and so um, while we're waiting for him to get back on, um, who all is currently working with or discipling someone that would be considered Generation Z? So maybe we'll just go around, talk about what are some of the challenges that you've seen currently with discipling this generation as opposed to maybe 
um, the generation after. It is him. Yeah. He says, yes, I remember you from MPL, Ohio in February at Finley yeah. E Free Church. Um, I think that we put lots of positives for me. Can you hear me all right? Okay, Josh is back on. So sorry. Internet droppage. I was wondering why everyone was looking at me so seriously. <laughs> <laughs> in this room to myself. Um, I'm gonna uh, go back. Uh, so here's a question. Was the most important question or the most important thing, yeah. Perfect, Neil Mims, thank you. Um, it, am I a disciple worth multiplying? Um, I would encourage you to ask that about yourself. Is um, the rhythms of your life, because um, you, you'll hear, the, hear this lingo in, in No Place Left World, we'll talk about mauling people. So modeling, assisting, watching, launching others. Um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen, and uh, I want to show you uh, one quick thing. But I love what Robert Coleman said in his book, uh, Master Plan of Evangelism. In that book, he said, there's simply no, there's simply no substitute for getting with people. There's just no substitute. And... Uh, Oh man, here we go. Right, he's just sharing the screen. Here we go. I'm gonna go back. Um, so there's no substitute. So this is what I've found. So in, in the world I'm in, around a lot of young people, a lot of youth pastors, a lot of people trying to reach their schools and colleges, is this, res this page I actually got from Big Life. They have amazing resources if you go to Big Life. But they talk about this, the imbalance of knowledge, obedience, and sharing that well, I don't meet people that don't know what they ought to be doing. And I think Ross Ramsey hit it really hard on the head this morning, talking about the best depth that you can get in maturity in your disciples is people who hear the word of God and obey it. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And so what are we looking for in the next generation? What kind of next generation leaders I mean, do you want to trying to get the screen captured? And so um, next generation leaders, we want ones that hear the word of God and obey it. How would we know if they're obeying it? If they're sharing, how do we know if they're sharing, if you ask them, right? So there's just no way to properly, there's no way to pop properly know without creating the type of environment where you're with people all the time. And I'm not sure this can happen on a weekly basis. And so I don't know what you're experiencing, but on a weekly basis, you'll just be overwhelmed with the, with the comings and goings of life where it's almost impossible. So we're trying to, all of us are trying to create a type of acts to type life, right? A daily checking in. And rather than checking in or rather than checking up on people, which is what I did as a youth pastor, hey, where are you? You know, how are you doing with this sin? How are you doing with reading your Bible? How are you doing with this? You know, I'm trying to get them to check in or check, you know, I'm checking in or checking up on them. I want them to check in. I want them to have the type of relationship where they're like, hey, man, this is where I'm at. Hey, this is where things are. And if we can start to level this out and create knowledge, obedience and sharing, um, that's what we need to do if we want it to be level in their life and to see them grow in maturity. But then again, are you going to take their word for it? I, I like to think of it like my kids. I don't take anything, you know, it's I make them do everything with me. I show them everything multiple times, hundreds of times. Last week I taught my daughter how to ride a bike and it was all hundreds of encouraging statements, hundreds of fails, hundreds of, Hey, this might happen or this might happen. And then you know what happened? Much to my chagrin, my, my dad came to visit and he got to show her how to ride the bike and he had an easier way. He held her bike from behind on the back of the seat. And so she had this visual of her riding by herself rather than me holding the handlebars. And I feel like that's what I did for many years in disciple making. I was holding the handlebars of everyone and I was just making it so that I wasn't releasing them fully. And I wasn't making them feel like they could ride on their own. They, they needed to bring their friends to come hear me share the gospel on Friday night. They had to bring their friends to come hear me, you know, after the football game. 
you know, hey, come bring them to this, come bring them to do that, come bring them to this. And I wasn't creating disciple makers. And I'll never forget it. Much of us have had uh, some kind of interaction with Jeff Sundell. And um, in my interaction about six years ago for the first time, he asked me if I was a youth pastor. I said, yes. He said, do I make disciples? I said, yes. <laughs> and then he asked me, do your disciples make disciples? I said, no. Once I had thought about it. And he said, oh, and he didn't mean anything by it. He just kind of looked at me and said, I guess you don't make healthy disciples yet. And I thought, wow, I have been making healthy disciples. And so what, what's our goal? I would encourage you this. You'll hear this probably in many different workshops, many different people. But my takeaway from hanging out with guys like Carter, or guys like Yin Kai or Jeff Sundell, those people, they never skip this step. They make a list of names and they tell the people they disciple to go after those names of people. They say, now, when you train someone, it's the best kind of training to teach them, expose them to the tools, you know, what kind of tools, your testimony, you know, um, you expose them to the four fields. A lot of the lingo that people don't understand, it's because they haven't read the four fields yet. Shank and understand that. We're called to go. Who should you go to? That's that list of names that we just talked about. Those are your friends, your family, people you work with, your school, your community. You need to teach them how to share their story, how to share the gospel. Um, there's wonderful apps that have been made to help track all these kinds of things. The Seed Sower app, No Place Left Dot Tools. And you realize, don't just tell them to go obey, check on them, check on that list. How did those people respond to the gospel? Um, were they a yellow light? Were they a green light? If someone prayed to receive Christ, have they been baptized yet? Have they been brought into fellowship? Are they growing in any kind of three-thirds format? What that means is, are they looking back at their week? Are they looking into the word of God for the authority and the spirit of God to lead them? Are they setting goals for the next week? And I feel like this step three is really what kind of sets the four fields apart. Lots of people gather. Lots of people might be sharing the gospel, we hope. Uh, lots of people have made a list at some time. But... Are they producing people that know how to do all of this? Um, a youth pastor that I trained last year, Jacob um, Simmons, he, uh, he had a young girl. Her name was Nora. And I'll never forget it. After three weeks of taking her out, doing mainly, hey, come to this apartment, come share with everyone you see. She realized she had a sweet spot. She would share with younger people, age eight, nine, 10 years old. And she would just win them to Christ every time we got there. She would just win them to Christ. She would train them how to share their story, and then she would introduce them to me. Hey, this is Nadalia. She just prayed to receive Christ. We're going to her family now to tell her what she did, and she's going to share with her whole family. I have never in my life seen anything like that before, where someone knew how to share the gospel, knew how to win them to Christ, knew how to aim for their whole family, and she was in sixth grade. They traveled to Baltimore. They went on a trip to the Dominican a few months ago um, with no place left practitioners. And they shared the gospel something like 2,000 times, you know, a team of 10 people, one hundreds of people to Christ. Um, why did they know how to do that? Because they took time to figure out, hey, let's train people to how to go for a list of people. Let's get them to complete this and create new lists and teach their disciples to make a list. Let's take them out to share the gospel. And let's constantly do it till they form a competency, till they form that character. And the Holy Spirit directs them to want to share with others, train others. Um, this is that principle played out in the life of Paul. You can, um, I can attach this, by the way, this, um, this Google slide, so you don't have to take screenshots or anything. We, I can send this to everybody. But here it is, played it out in the life of Paul. We see Paul discipled a few. You know, no place left really comes from Romans 15, where Paul looked back after discipling 12 men in Asia for three years the average length of a youth pastor's term, and he reached Asia, right? So Asia, that there was no place left for him to work. And so how did he do it? By discipling in a few, and he taught them everything he had. And so we want to do that, and so we, I encourage people, here's a blank slate of paper. Who are your three? Who's your main three? You know, have your big list that you're going to go for, but who are the three you can go for right now? Who can you say, hey, come do this with me? You know, uh, a lot of the podcasts right now, we're all asking this question, how do you find a good leader? You know, the best leaders that I have found come to me. Does that make sense? I'll have a training and they'll say, I want to know more about that. Can I hang out with you some more? 
And then I just make myself a little bit hard to follow. I'll say, yeah, you can hang out with me. I'd love to hang out with you. I'd love to catch time with you, but I'll make it some kind of commitment. I'll say, you should come on Thursdays where we all practice and train and pray together. And then that becomes a filter. Or I say, hey, we always go out on Thursday nights or Saturdays. You should come share the gospel there with me. And then they start coming. And then um, I find my three. And so I would encourage you, find your three. do it is how Jesus did it. The invitation was to be with him, to, to do what he was doing. And so that's what we want to do. Um, if you've never done this before, I've seen a ton of fruit in training the next generation and training them to share their story. They're all about stories. I have found that this generation is incredibly afraid. And probably because of COVID, we're going to see even more people afraid. And so I think even while you train them their story, train them how to uh, break the ice um, with prayer. Uh, train them how to approach people. I have every practice session I've had, and I've trained a lot of people in this last year, uh, probably, probably like a thousand people, different youth groups, you know, and what I always do is I practice them getting rejected. Always do that. Um, say, do role playing and have them practice getting rejected by the gospel. And it lightens everyone up. They're like, oh yeah, that might happen. But um, they'll be more prepared for it. Um, two months ago, uh, we went to a uh, train of a few churches that were pursuing no place left in their city that came together. And they had been rejected in this street um, pretty significantly. And everyone's saying, you know, yeah, sure, pray for me, but not interested in the gospel. Then all of a sudden they found a young kid and this kid um, prays to receive Christ and then says, hey, can I come out with you guys now, now that I'm saved? <laughs> and he starts coming out with them. And he, then he said, can I come and hang out the rest of the time? And then after we prayed with a bunch of people and went out on mission for a little while, we came back to report what happened. This kid grabs the mic and he starts crying. And he says, I want to thank every single one of you for going out and finding me. And he said, my stepfather poured gasoline on me and threatened to light me on fire. And I thought my life was worth nothing. And you guys came and you, and you came after me. And now I'm, I'm brand new in Jesus. And he got baptized that night. Isn't that awesome? I know you're all saying that's awesome. That's awesome. And listen, that, that, kid's, life, that kid's life is crazy changed forever. And then that kid, he gave his testimony and I think, Three other kids decided they needed to get baptized and saved that night. And so that's Gen Z. And then having a vision for their school and their family. Audio visual is helping a little to teach is to the places he was going to and so your uh, audio is breaking up if he was so, uh, if you pause a second, it'll catch up with you. Yeah, I just told him to kill his video. Just that probably will help if his video is shut off. So, how about now? Thumbs up. Can you hear me good? Yeah, we can hear you, bro. Okay, good. So um, all that to say for that part that is um, that broke up just now is the invitation for the next generation. Um, they are looking for meaningful work. Like I, we work at a crossroads, it's crossroads summer camp and we have 50 young people that dedicate their whole summer to uh, be a part of a gospel mission. And, you know, it's just amazing. And so I think young people are under challenged. 
And so what I would encourage all of you to do, no matter where you are, um, whether you're in a business, whether you're uh, a youth pastor, pastor, you're a, a missions leader, um, everyone, in my opinion, should be offering some kind of residency uh, to develop the next generation. Um, we want to be winning them to Christ. So, you know, if you're part of No Place Left World, you know this, that we're always looking for people of peace. We're hoping to get in the home. We're hoping to have discovery Bible studies. Um, we're hoping to win whole households to faith. And in doing that and going to these apartments, I realized I didn't want, I wasn't trying to win young people anymore. I was trying to win adults. And I'll never forget it. I had like 20 kids following me around, you know, just because we would pray for the kids and all this stuff. And they would just follow me around week after week. You know, we would go there and we'd take new people there and they'd want to play. They would want to hang out. And I wasn't sharing the gospel with them. I was trying to win their parents. And um, all of a sudden, the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, let them come to me. And, uh, and I, I, I changed methods <laughs> and we started winning. We started winning young people to Christ. And, um, and this past summer, Brandon, who's on this call, you know, it was the same thing. We invited the whole community. We had a big barbecue. We're sharing, Brandon actually shared the gospel. And um, of all the people that were there, of everyone that responded, it was 10 young men that prayed to receive Christ and were baptized that day in a little blow up pool from Dollar General, right? And he baptized them and then their parents came to watch it and encourage them to do it, encourage them to obey Christ. And so even in that, and that, that was another separate occasion where the Lord was like, let them come to me. And, and so, you know, we know in the a book of Malachi, it says that in the last days, the hearts of fathers will turn towards their children and children towards their fathers. And so I want to encourage you. Yes, we want to get in the home and yes, we want to see discovery Bible studies happen. And Yes, you can win young people to Christ and get in the home that way. Um, you can, and, uh, and you should. Most decisions are made four to 14 years old, <laughs> the initial decision. And so do they need to be discipled? Yes. Do they need to be trained? Yes. Um, do you need to um, be a part of building them up? Yes. What's the best way to win a home is to win the father, supposedly. They say 95% of the home will come to faith if you can win a father to, to faith. But what about in these places where the fathers aren't home? Now it falls to the mother. And so we need to win moms. We need to win. And this is what I've learned um, taking the next generation out. Um, I started asking people, just come out with me. Just come out. And, and people, and then they would invite their friends. And all of a sudden, you know, we would have these young college kids, these young high school kids, uh, these young middle school kids out with us in the gospel. And, um, what I've learned is it's not the people you think will stick with it that usually will. Um, a lot of times God will promote someone that I wouldn't have thought would be the person to really go after it and, and go hard. And afterwards, I always have a time of like eating dinner together or talking about what happened. And afterwards, almost all the time, these college students grown up in the church, going to a Christian university, they'll all say, how come I was never shown this? How come no one ever showed me to share my story? How come I, I never even knew how to share the gospel? How come I, I don't even know how to lead a Bible study? You know, am I allowed to baptize someone? Um, I didn't know I could do this. And it's person after person after person. And, um, you know, the stats have come back. We know that the, most of the church doesn't share the gospel regularly, constantly makes whatever the reason is, the reason. And... Um, we know that the constant modeling, the constant training needs to happen. And this is what I would encourage you. So we've mainly gone to hard places in our city, um, places where I asked Jesus, and this is what I would encourage another question for you. Just ask Jesus, Jesus, if you were here, where would you be? Jesus, if you were in my city right now, where would you be? And, and then just go there. Um, that's th the answer to that question for me was, I saw these people out. I saw these people um, in a poor side of town. And I felt like if Jesus was anywhere in my town, he would be where the poor were. And so I started going there. And I, I would just encourage you, if you want to create a new culture of the next generation that are going to do hard things, then do hard things with them. You know, take them to do the hard things. I'll never forget it. Um, my wife looked at me. We were trying to do both, by the way, and maybe many of you are trying to do both. I was trying to be a part of a big church and do that whole process and then also 
you know, do disciple making movement. And at some point I just felt like I was going crazy. I felt like I couldn't be committed to anyone. I felt like I was committed everywhere. I felt like I was giving a little bit of myself to a lot of people. And then I just remember it all came crumbling down. I was facing burnout. And my wife asked me the monster question, which was, are you going to disciple our family? <laughs> you travel and train and speak and do all this stuff, but are you going to disciple our kids? And I just, I just remember I looked at my little girl and I said, what's church about? What's church mean? And she goes, I love to slide at church and I love, I love drawing at church. And I love, and I was like, I don't think she's answering this. Like I like, <laughs> like, you know, and, and I just finally looked at my wife and said, you know what, what if we, what if we just started a church? You know, what if we, what if we did this? What if we just started one at that apartment? You know, what if we went there and prayer walked and shared the gospel with our kids and I'll never forget it. She goes, all right, do it if you're going to do it. <laughs> anyway, so the first time I wanted to get out of it, it started raining and I was like, it's raining. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, let's go back to the church. You know, they have a building and it's nice and it's not raining. And she goes, listen, do you care about this or not? And I was like, okay. She goes, they have rain jackets, umbrellas. And like, they're little, they're like four and two and just born. And um, then we went out in the rain and I'll never forget it. Everyone let us in their home. They were like, what are you doing out here in the rain? And they just let us in and let us pray for them. Let us read the Bible with them. I actually think going in the rain is a brilliant idea now. I thought it was a terrible idea, but going in the rain is awesome idea because people are like, what are you doing here? All of a sudden it's radical. Why are you here? But like, we came, we woke up this morning because we wanted to pray here and we would meet all kinds of people. Um, people would be like, I can't believe you're here. I was wondering if someone would come pray for me today or, you know, just crazy stuff, the stuff that happens when you're out in the harvest. And so, and, and lastly, I want to say, and then I want us to have time to talk and talking too much, but um, have a residency. So I had young people, uh, a guy that went on a mission trip to India and met no place left people and wanted to come back to South Carolina and do it. And he saw me on the website and just called me. We met up and I said, cool, man, let's go, let's go out. Let's go out, share the gospel together. And I'll hold you accountable. And um, man, week after week, he didn't do it. He wouldn't share the gospel. He said, you know, I'm on a Christian campus. I can't share the gospel. And I'm like, what do you mean? You can't share. And, you know, and just, I would just kind of be nice. And he was committed to lots of people and lots of places. And then finally, uh, I just told, his name's Logan, he wouldn't care. But, you know, I asked Logan, I just said, Logan, you know, where do you want to be committed, man? Just, just pick somewhere. And, uh, and he picked a, a church that wasn't me. And I was a little bit offended. And th I just want to encourage you, that's going to happen too. You're going to have people that don't want to be with you. And they're going to go back to their old wineskin, old ways of doing things and for whatever reason. And there's lots of reasons. He's a single guy. Maybe he wanted to meet a single girl. You know, we had lots of not single girls with us at the time, you know, and just all this stuff. And uh, finally, I spoke at a BCM and, and I, I invited everyone after reading Mark 5 before I preached to just leave and go share with the lost person that that was going to be the point of my whole sermon. And um, no one got up. But afterwards, he came up to me and said, I want to come back. I want to do this. But you know what he needed? He's like, I need a, a, a residency. I need like an internship for my degree. Can I please do that with you? And um, I had two guys, three guys, actually. Um, we've had, I think, six residents so far in some form or fashion. But th it was stuff they needed for their college or high school. They needed volunteer hours or they needed this or they needed that. But they wanted to do it with me. But they also needed a railway. And so I want to encourage you, Create railways for yourself, for your ministry, for your church that create a pipeline of young people because a lot of young people need to go volunteer somewhere. They need to give, expose them to this stuff, you know, expose them to movement, to sharing the gospel, to making disciples. For the most part, many of them, it'll be the first time they do it in their whole life. And they will, as you know, if you're here, you probably care about those things. And when you taste, get a taste for making disciples, it'll change you forever. And you know, now Logan is one of the most faithful we have. He's a crazy trainer. They made him president of BCM and he's going to use his whole year to train, you know, hundreds of students. It's the largest BCM in South Carolina. And he's, what's he want to do? I'll be like, man, what are you going to do to train these guys? He's like, I'm going to tell them to go share the gospel. You know, the thing that he didn't want to do, you know, anyway, all of that changes, you know, when you start exposing, letting them be with you and um, doing the relational pieces. And so, um, yeah, 
I hope that makes sense. It makes sense in my head. Give me a thumbs up if you're if you're with me. Yes. All right, cool. Um, and I just want to encourage you. Uh, there are so many resources um, to learn about residency. Um, Justin White, um, the NoPlaceLeft.net uh, website. You can look up residency. Um, everything is open source, so you you can change your residency. You know those pastors that were on this morning, Don Waybright and all those guys, a lot of them have some form of a residency. You know, we planted a church. Uh, we did it through the IMB, um, partly because we wanted to give to the cooperative program so we could launch people through the IMB to the nations. Um, and so I would encourage you to think of how am I gonna get the next generation involved in the Great Commission? And it's by having them live a Great Commission lifestyle now you know, making disciples now. Every time I meet an IMB missionary or a missionary in, in, from anywhere, they always say the same kinds of things. Do these people know how to pray? Do these people know how to lead others to faith? Do these people know how to make disciples that multiply? Do they know how to train people in simple reproducing tools? Do they know how to gather? Do they know how to release authority? Um, if they can do that on this side of the pond, then they'll know how to do it somewhere else the plane won't tra change them, <laughs> right? So, you know, we need to create the kinds of people now that will know what to do in the long term of their life. And even right now with COVID, if people only think I can only be a missionary if I live overseas, what about everyone that just got brought back to the States? What are they going to do now? I want to tell you, if you've been trained, if your lifestyle has been changed, then these people aren't going to miss a beat. Now they're going to do it with people from their own culture and language, or they're going to find people from other cultures and languages. Um, in the city that they live in. They'll choose where they live carefully. They'll pick their habits and rhythms and friends carefully. And so obviously this is a holistic thing, but um, I, w I just want to encourage you that the pipeline is getting shorter if we don't do something now. It's an extremely urgent time to win the next generation now when they can be one and when they're mostly one. Um, part of the, the best gospel shares I know in life personally right now are in high school. They share weekly, going three, four, five times a week that they're sharing, more than any adult I know. Um, they can be challenged to reach whole schools, whole counties. They're the most available. They're willing to sell everything. And so um, I just want to encourage you to, to go hard for this next generation. And if we're truly believing that we're the generation that's going to finish the task, which we are, we are praying that and hoping that, you know, Bible translated in every language by 2030, and, you know, all these crazy goals. Um, who's going to be this generation that's going to go hard and go places that are hard? You know, most likely it'll be people that are single and young and willing to do anything. And so, um, and co-vocational, and um, it's going to be probably not who we expect. And so, yeah, hopefully y'all are feeling that and sensing that. Um, is there any questions? Anything you got? I would love um, for us to chat some. And so any feedback, questions, anything. Yeah, Josh, you know, I, I think uh, watching you, uh, it's been incredible to watch you cast vision for young people. Um, you're a consulate guy. You're probably one of the best that I know um, at casting big vision, both to their family and neighborhood, but also to the nations. Any, any tips or practical things you have for us to, on like really casting vision for the Generation Z? Man, casting vision. I just think, uh, man, I, I read this crazy thing. Um, Matthew 18, I would encourage you guys all to read it. A lot of us talk about, you know, leaving the 99 and going for the one. But in the context of that story, Jesus is talking about the little sheep. The, it, young people were being brought to him. And he says this crazy verse. He says, I tell you the truth, their angels are always before the face of my father in heaven. It's a crazy, it's a crazy story. And, you know, like, what in the world does that even mean? But just that he said, let them come to me. And so I just want to encourage you, you cannot steward what you don't have. And so some of you might be like, I don't have young people around me, or I don't know anyone that's young right now. You know, I live here. Well, why don't you? <laughs> You know, why can't, why can't you go somewhere where there's kids? You know, why, why can't you go to uh, apartments where you see toys on the front lawn? 
you know, why can't you win them? Um, I, you know, it's kind of like the unreached, unengaged people groups, right? Why are they unreached and unengaged? Um, because people aren't aiming for them yet and doing whatever it takes, you know? So if we want to reach the, new, the next generation, I would just encourage you to go where they are. And so that could be a recreational place. That could be the school. I think the school is a wide open door in the United States, as far as if you guys are stateside, you know, schools are possible. And um, training one kid to, to lead others is how you can win a ton of kids to Christ. Um, hey, Josh, I got a question for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's the context that you find your gatherings? Are you doing them and training up churches? Are you using campuses? Are you using apartment complexes with kids and gathering? What are you finding the receptivity and what, what uh, conduit are you using? Okay, so um, I, I, I'm, I have a unique situation, probably like, um, you know, George Robinson. You know, if you're a college professor, you're always going to be around young people, right? So he's always going to be around young people. But also, he chose that profession, right? <laughs> he chose that profession so he could influence the next generation. You know, for me... Um, I have found myself working with young people since I was 14, you know, almost 23 years now. And for me, I'm, I'm in a, a camp world, a gathering, a week long experience. Um, you know, a lot of decisions for Christ are made at a camp for the first experience. Probably if I asked uh, right now, the room right now, probably a lot of you had some kind of encounter at a camp um, when you were younger, where you got more committed to Christ or first made a commitment to Christ. Um, so I end up in those environments a lot. And then what happened was I started seeing people respond to the gospel and I would walk up to the youth pastor and be like, man, isn't that so exciting? And they would all look at me like this. What do I do now? And I would be like, wait, what? You don't know, <laughs> you know? And then I, I started having lunch with one at a time. Then I was like, maybe I need to have lunch with more than this. And I started doing like a two or three night training going through the four fields. And then for me, the context, John, became um, in Baptist world, which is a lot of my world around here in South Carolina. Um, they'll have like citywide events. A lot of youth pastors are good friends with each other. I found even more so than pastors. You know, youth pastors will know each other, hang out with each other, um, do things together. And they would plan a fall and, and spring retreat called Discipleship Now Weekend. And so I started encouraging those environments rather than just be typical you know, roller skating and a sermon at night to make the whole weekend like a missional experience, the whole weekend practice and training. And what happened was um, revival broke out in like two of them. And then from then on, they started talking to each other and started expecting that to happen. They'd be like, Josh, can you come do that again? And I'd be like, I, you know, that's nothing I'm doing. We have to pray. We have to train. We have to read the Bible and obey. And I, we started seeing kids run out of the room, calling everyone on their phone to share their story. We started seeing hundreds and hundreds of gospel shares in a night. They started playing secret church games where they would have to get captured and share their testimony. And um, those kids are not the same. Uh, there's kids in North Carolina right now that were one to Christ on a Monday night at camp. On Tuesday, one their first person to Christ. That night, been baptized in a fountain on campus. And then they've been baptizing people, uh, winning people to Christ in their hometown ever since, every Sunday. You know, just craziness like that, where, um, yes, there's been gatherings, but typically for me, because I'm in this context of youth pastors and pastors, these guys all talk and they'll say, hey, we want to have a training event. And then they look to me for like the guide to the day. And I usually try to push them to make it a Friday, Saturday, Sunday thing, like a Friday training, a Saturday going and a Sunday celebrating. So that's been the context um, for me. That was really helpful. Josh, I was wondering, do you have any, because um, uh, you've said loads of really good things about why it's um, good to work with young people, but do you have any challenges from working with young people? Oh, man, the challenges are, they're hard to get with. So we saw a ton of kids pray to receive Christ this summer. And then, in, especially in low income areas, I started finding out the kids in an apartment they don't even necessarily live at that apartment. <laughs> they might be like visiting an aunt or visiting an uncle. And so you, you're facing a, a very like lucid housing concept. And a lot of people in apartments in low income areas are constantly being kicked out of apartments. 
Um, no one's being evicted right now. That's nice. But um, soon the evictions are coming and they end up moving. They end up being transient. Um, but again, I feel like the, uh, the, the hard part is that it's, it's hard to, um, the follow-up is not always in their control. They're in their parents' guardianship, but also that's the opportunity, if that makes sense. The opportunity is, hey, you know, going back and it's awkward. Hey, your, your son just prayed to receive Christ. <laughs> you know, like, you know, we're not asking anyone parents' permission to do it, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and we're trying to use the baptism moment to say, hey, you should come see this, right? Like with the kids that prayed to receive Christ this summer and were baptized that day, we told them, go home, get a change of clothes and tell your parents and everyone in that house to come see it. And they did, you know, yeah. so I would encourage you in that regard. Gosh, another question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm just wondering, um, in the, in the context of what you're, it sounds like most of your context has been youth pastors uh, the camp, and then working with youth pastors. Any partnership with uh, Youth for Christ, Young Life, FCA, those that typically are working in a campus that majority of their context are non-Christians, where a church might have 70%, 60% Christians, uh, where a context where you had mainly non-Christians. Yes, so... Um... I work with all those organizations too, mainly because most of the people that work in those organizations are also youth pastors that volunteer in them. And so here there's a big one called YCI. And so my part with that is I spend, you know, a monthly gathering with them. Uh, I weekly train uh, one of their leaders and basically kind of let the proof be in the pudding. Um, the guys that I train that volunteer in the high schools and the young people that are there um, we train them, release them. So during COVID, I, I know a lot of these YCI young people and um, trained, I want to say 15 of them over Skype and Zoom and train them in the four fields, train them in their story, train them in their testimony, train them in their oikos. And um, I did it five days, five days in a row for one hour. And I told them all the cost of admission was that you share the gospel that day. So you had the same day obedience to be a part of the group. Um, and they all did it. it. It filtered like one or two, but the rest of them stayed. And, um, and now I just get text messages all the time. Thank you so much. It changed my life. You know, I'm going for it. We're doing it. We started a Bible study. We started a new one today. And so I think young people are just under challenged, to be honest with you. So um, a lot of them are starting to change their story too. Like most of those groups, they throw a pizza party and they invite a youth pastor to share the gospel. You know, now they're changing their model to creating disciple makers. And rather than just having a meeting in a classroom, now they're splitting the group in half and they have their meeting so that they're official club and they send the other half of the members out to meet students, pray with them and share the gospel and try to win kids to Christ. Yeah, I'd say too, John, just to piggyback on what Josh said that um, like in Oklahoma City, YFC, uh, the organization there has completely transitioned to adopting a no place left strategy and vision. Um, so YFC in Oklahoma City was just exhausted with year after year, new programs, new resources, new things that cost money. And um, when they figured out, out that they could train their leaders for free <laughs> and that the students would actually have something really simple and reproducible to, to practice, um, there has been hundreds of people come into the kingdom uh, through the students um, in Oklahoma City. And then, so they really have, they have a, a weekly club where they do evangelism, but then they have on Fridays, they have the student leaders get together and do three thirds. Um, but that was through, you know, influence of just a few YFC people, which actually Josh had connected me to with some YFC people in Florida when we were there and use that connection back in Oklahoma City. So I, I definitely think that these other organizations, YFC, Young Life, um, uh, Fish Club, all these others are, are, you know, I think programs come and go in those organizations just like they do in most local churches. And people are just looking for something really simple that's actually going to uh, multiply among, among the students. Something else I just wrote. Um, definitely, we want to celebrate hundreds of kids coming to faith. We always celebrate those numbers. A lot of times organizations need to have numbers like that to celebrate and, you know, raise money. But I would encourage you to um, celebrate attempts. 
you know, you've heard other people talk about that, but a lot of times what I notice among young people is they feel guilty. They haven't won anyone to Christ yet. They need to know that that's not up to them. Does that make sense? Constantly. I've noticed the next generation is very thin skinned. Um, a lot of them. And so if they don't feel like they're celebrated, <coughs> if they don't feel like they're celebrated, if they're not feeling like, like it's a, a legalistic expectation that they win someone to Christ and that they're always setting goals and they're always meeting them. And that it becomes like a, a you know, a, a check in and or check up and not a check in. Um, they really need to be loved and um, coached and mentored in all things of life and really celebrate when they do obey. And what I've noticed is once they do and win someone to Christ for the first time, if you share enough, you'll win someone to Christ. And when that does happen, if you, if you, um, it, they'll be excited all on their own. You won't have to conjure any up for them. They'll be excited and their life will be like just different. They'll be like, wow, God used me. And that's where you say, he's always been using you. He's always been using these shares. He's always been forming you, you, you know, just help them form that theology while they're young, that it's not up to them. Hey, Josh, I want to put Burke on the spot just for a yeah. second on what you said, celebrating attempts. Burke, would you share your baseball diamond analogy on, on celebrating attempts? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we just, uh, we, we kind of talk about it. If you approach somebody and get a chance to pray with them, that's a single. If you get a chance to share the gospel, that's a, a double. If you see someone receive Christ, that's a triple. And if they meet back with you, that's a home run. And if they uh, have shared, uh, that's a grand slam. They share with their family. But we just reminded people, yeah, everybody likes to see the triples, the home runs, the grand slams, but championships are won. If you go back, I mean, just baseball, know, you know it. Baseball uh, championships are won by those teams who hit consistent singles and doubles. So we've just tried to, even like when we get together, we'll, we'll, we'll say, hey, how, how, many, how many singles, you know, uh, did we hit today? How many doubles? You know, and so we, and we say, let's hear some stories. So we kind of, yeah, we, I, I agree with you, Josh. You just got to celebrate the attempts. Yeah. Yes. That's good. I love that analogy. I play baseball, so I love that. What, what's a stolen base? <laughs> that's what we all want so yeah that's where you go you're not settling for single you you always want to try to go the next way you'll press uh, a little bit what's the hit and run where you pray and share at the same time <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll go with that that sounds good i love that yeah yeah stolen bases are probably getting recruiting christians to get on board yeah, I, and I think that's been hard for me. I think at first I just wanted to get new laborers out of the harvest, um, you know, to find new ones and then be excited. And um, I think it was uh, Angie Sundell said to me one day, she goes, I don't think you've really found a person of peace yet. And I was like, what do you mean? There's people letting us in their home and we're having church in their home. And she said, well, they haven't owned the mission. And so they need to receive you, receive the gospel and receive the mission to find a real person of peace. And so I think I was just only wanting that, if that makes sense. I only wanted that experience. I wanted someone that was not Christian before, you know, to receive Christ, own the mission and just kind of do this. And I started telling myself that's never going to happen. And then literally like three weeks ago in the middle of COVID, we were dropping off to this low income area, some food. And this lady was like, man, I have a whole church in here waiting for you. <laughs> you know, they're like, what? You know, like when we could all meet again. Yeah, my brother needs Christ. And, you know, she had all these kids running around. I was like, oh, man, it's a lot of kids. But, you know, just all this stuff. And I was like, man, who ever says that to anyone? You know, you just so God surprises you. But I think also I see Jesus recruiting guys that were seeking him out. And I think I've learned a lot from that, too, where you can look for faithful people that are hungry for God and just invite them into what you're doing. And um and that's what he did. He, he, he was doing his thing no matter what. But these guys were, you know, like George Robinson says, the cat on the screen porch. And so those cats on the screen porch, you know, let them in. The, the hungry ones, the self-starting, uh, the faithful. Um, and then let them do things with you. Like I'm trying to organize more trainings in South Carolina. And I just tell everyone all the time, hey, you should come to this. Come swarm this. Come, come model this. 
And I've seen them own it on another level when I ask them to be the trainer. Um, and a lot of times that forces them, as you guys know, it forces them to learn everything, <laughs> making them teach it. <laughs> well, we're officially done on time. I I'll hang out for as long as y'all want to do, but um, I would love to talk more and uh, love to hear from everyone really, but uh, you are officially released from breakout time. And if you want to hang out and ask questions, you certainly can. But thank you guys. I know you could have, you could have chose any breakout. You chose this one with bad internet connection and um, me, but I'm really happy to hang out with y'all. Thanks so much. Hey, Josh, I, I have a personal question. Sure. Uh, yeah, do, you, do you have any run in or connection with Alec Campbell and Anderson? He's a pastor of a. Alec I Campbell. Know that name. Campbell. What church is it? You know, I don't know. I just, he's the first person I ever saw the Lord save. And I, I, um, I keep in touch with him a little bit. So I know he's a pastor now, but uh, in Anderson. So, but anyway. Oh, if you, if you guys go, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know him. But I, I, I meant to, I promise this. If you guys wanted that thing, that presentation I showed earlier, this is it. You can just copy that link and it's yours. It has all that stuff on it. Um, right. But yeah, there's Thanks. a, I know, do you know Chuck Campbell? No. Well, I, know, I know, I know a Chuck Campbell. Yeah. But yeah, they, they, uh, but yeah, he's at Christ Reformed Church. Christ Reformed Church. Yeah. I don't think I know him. So I wish yeah. I did. I, maybe I, I'll ask him. I'll be like, Burke Wilson told me to say hi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Next time I'm in Clemson, we'll try to get together. All right. Sounds All good. Right. All right. Good seeing you. Good seeing you, Carter. Yeah, John. Good hey, John, I'd love to uh, Great to ask you a couple more questions, if I could. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, Carter, can you stay on just a minute, too, or you need to run to something? No, I'm good, bro. I'm, I'm on. Okay. I wanted to tell you the context of, of where we have been with students and just a, a prayer that we might have to, uh, to really be more proficient at what God's called us to. Uh, Janelle and I, and I'll get Janelle so she can see her, uh, both of us trusted Christ, the Youth for Christ, back in high school when we were 16 years old. Um, awesome. We then, uh, after college, worked with uh, Campus Life, the part of Youth for Christ, uh, for I did it seven, 17 to 20 years, okay? Um, then we got connected with E3 after that, and churches, etc. cetera, uh, and so we... Uh, We've stayed engaged through things like Awana in past and things like that through churches, uh, but not really reaching lostness. Um, back when I Am Second started, uh, we re-engaged. Uh, we currently have a couple people we trained, and we really haven't been as actively connected with them, but trained with I Am Second, uh, which came out of our E3 Partners Ministry. Uh, and so we've got uh, probably two or three middle schools and a few high schools that are led by leaders uh, that we trained, uh, but they're pretty much independent now. Uh, I attend a youth pastor gathering about once a month, but it's not like they have caught the vision. Uh, it's like I'm the old guy that shows up at the youth pastor meeting. Um, and... Uh, and so the other thing, other context we've started recently uh, is a, we've got maybe a handful of college students that we're training out of Trinity University, uh, which is nearby. Uh, Janelle's alumni of Trinity. It's probably 10 minutes or less from here. Um, and then um, we, we did a, we started doing some refugee work um, with uh, Congolese, because with E3, my main hat is I'm uh, international with E3 partners for uh, Uganda and South Sudan. So we're doing a lot in our city in different contexts, but our main hat has been international. And I'm trying to think, how can I be more proficient in the, Z in the Gen Z area um, from, from the younger college students down to, to later middle school, really early high school, ages to equip them to be disciple makers 
and I don't feel like I have a good on-ramp uh, as, as much to be able to set that vision. So that's our context. Uh, I'll let you guys kind of speak into maybe what you've experienced. So we're grandparents wanting to disciple our grandchildren. So uh, not some, some of them are not um, old enough yet to go with us, but some we can take with us and, uh, and reaching Gen Z. Um, I think my, my first thing would be what I, what I've noticed is that young people, college age, you know, I, I would think, you know, though I'm not, so I, my travels internationally, uh, have led me to be around Turkish people, Cypriot people, um, Turkish background people. And, um, I would say in the, in the times that we were on mission in Cyprus, that there was so much that happened around a meal you know and you know if, if you're able and willing to um i think people are always looking for community at that age and direction and purpose um a significance and um even just opening your home and having a meal and having jesus conversations at that at that meal to me is like the most natural way to have young people come be with you and um, and to make time with you if you're not going to join them where they are in terms of like a recreational thing or um, you know going somewhere where they're they're around and so I know Carter and I talked last week but you know even he said it like I didn't envision myself trying to reach these young Afghani you know teenagers that have crazy Instagram accounts you know it's just kind of hard thing where you're like oh, I start to feel like you're too old or you know, like I feel that way now with young people, <laughs> you know, it was just like, I'm like, oh, their movies are all bad, <laughs> you know, just like, there's just like all this stuff. And, but I, I think, you know, obviously we believe that the gospel crosses that barrier too of age and culture. And so you're trying to create a context for it at that point. And I think engaging them um, is just, you know, praying for them, obviously that kind of engagement, but then trying and seeing what works and i think praying and trying um a lot of times co college students all around the world they're all starving you know what i mean they all <laughs> need somewhere to do their laundry they all <laughs> you know are like looking for even bigger things than that um i know friends that are trying to reach um, that same segment of people in other places around the world and they um they became like a life coach for them like hey let me help you you know let me help you get a resume let me help you um, get into the States or let me help you with your paperwork or, you know, is there something I can way I can serve you? So I don't know if that's helpful, but I know friends that have done that. Carter can probably speak better to it in terms of Congolese. Yeah, no, and that's great, great words, bro. Uh, uh, John and, and Janelle, I just so admire y'all and uh, y'all's faith. And uh, I mean, I, I know we've known each other for a while through Chuck and E2 Partners. So just grateful for y'all's example and model in the faith and marriage. Uh, were y'all being serious when you said uh, that your, your grand, grandkids, how old are your grandkids? Oldest one is 10 and our youngest is uh, not quite six months. You know, so there's the widespread between there but we have a, a nine and a ten year old 14 can, grandkids now yeah so so we can take the oh, nine wow. and ten year old with wow. us with permission of their parents uh yeah. we have it uh we let their parents decide because they know i mean they come see us all the time but they know how they act at home so they want them uh to have a certain maturity level uh before they go in the sense that they will obey when they're out with us so We've started with the oldest already. Uh, I, I'll tell you, uh, just from personal experience, my, my grandparents made the biggest impact in my life in those early years. Uh, and it was, it was not necessarily the thing they took me to, it was the transitional time that it took to get there, you know? Uh, yeah. So my grandparents, they would take me to Six Flags, you know, down in San Antonio or, or uh, Dallas and uh, take me to Sonic and take me to Brahms to get an ice cream cone. and. Um, you know, it, it, what I was in the moment excited about going to that place. But what I remember when I look back is the conversations we had. 
And so don't underestimate those moments, those mundane moments of saying, hey, you know, let's go grab an ice cream cone or let's run to Sonic and get a, you know, uh, an icy or whatever. Um, I think those are huge moments, you know, those mundane moments. Um, you can have a huge impact. And then, you know, just using those moments intentionally to model for them. You know, if you're going to Sonic, you know, pr ask to pray and share with the uh, lady that comes to the car. Or if you're going to 7-Eleven and get an icy, pray and share the gospel with the cashier and let them see that. Uh, you know, my, my grandfather, uh, uh, who really started this first spark of faith in my life, I watched him do that at least 30 or 40 times, you know, he'd take me out to eat, you know, at Cracker Barrel on a Saturday morning and he would share the gospel right there with the, the waitress. And uh, I remember that. Now, it wasn't something super simple and reproducing, <laughs> but he did it. And I remember that even as like a six, seven, eight year old boy. And so, uh, you know, I, I know it goes back to Mono, but you have a special, um, specifically with your grandkids, uh, place, you know, to be a model. And they're so impressionable right now at this age, you know, before they get a cell phone and get into junior high, you know, maybe some of them already are, but um, man, that, that's sick. I, I think it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer that talked about from the ages of like four or five to 10 or 11 are some of the most impressionable years in a child's life. And so don't underestimate the mundane moments that y'all you can have in their life and the, the seeds that that will bring to fruition and in, in, in their faith down the road. I mean, I was just literally texting my granddad uh, just last night, you know, t thanking him for his uh, uh, taking me to Sonic <laughs> when I was a nine year old boy and telling me about Jesus and showing me how to share Jesus at that moment. So uh as for the other things, you know, it sounds like y'all y'all have got your plate full with Uganda and uh, the organizations and all that. But I do know, you know, with with your immediate with your Oikos, man, that's a wide open door for you to model what it looks like to to follow Jesus. So, and you probably know yeah. this. I'm not telling you anything. I hope I'm just affirming. You know, oh, I, you, I, you, affirming. you probably have done. Yeah, I want to affirm that too. Just the faithfulness. Like my, my daughter sat down with her great aunt and went through our whole family tree and she's seven. And she said, what did they do? What were they like? What did they do? And you look at everyone's kind of obsessed with their like ancestry now, you know, like everyone's getting DNA tests and all this stuff. And so it might be that your faithfulness for these next 40 years of your life, <laughs> right? Will be like stuff that your grandkids will be like, man, they did that you know, all that time, you know what I mean? So like all of that in reaching them, the constant example and the exampling is just massive. And I think pray for favor with the Congolese. Like I think God makes a way when he, when you're trying to cross into different people groups, something will happen, you know, that, that person that'll be like, Hey, you know, you guys look great. Let me hang out with you. And then he'll reach a bunch of Congolese. You know, you just don't know. We do have one 11 year old boy from the Congolese who is that, but uh, during this COVID time, we're banned from the apartment complex to even go and be with them. So that's because the manager said, you know, you can't have any visitors right now. So uh, we're just trying to keep up with them as best we can, but they don't really have internet services like we do. So it's hard for them. Uh, but he has, we've made friendship between Alex, this Congolese boy, and uh, Hunter, who is 10. Alex is 11, Hunter's 10, and Hunter's been sharing the gospel. Since Hunter's our, uh, grandson. our oldest grandson. Um, he uh, started to learn to share the gospel when he was about four or five years old. So he's been sharing the gospel with his mom, uh, but we wanted to start taking Hunter and Alex together. Um, and Hunter is very gregarious and Alex is more reserved. They're a good match for each other. Uh, that has been shut down by the COVID thing. But uh, as soon as we're able to, we're going to go back to that and um, probably include our nine-year-old uh, granddaughter as well. That's Aaliyah. So they can be kind of like a team, you know, and they can be encouraging each other and go out with us and share the gospel in their own neighborhoods and in his uh, complex. So 
that's our plan. And we can't include Alex very much right now. He doesn't have the ability to get on with us. Those are all good micro ideas, and those are things that we're doing. I'd love to hear any more macro ideas you have to be able to influence youth uh, youth workers that are that are comp they're competent in their own uh, church or organizational network. But how has MPL become a resource there, and how can we serve in that capacity? Um, one thing I would tell you, since you are, have been doing this a long time, you're connected with E3. Um, so what I was doing, you know, four years ago, I'm working at this camp. I'm, I'm wanting to follow up with people. I'm sitting down in the cafeteria, um, sharing the gospel with a kid or two, trying to train a kid or two. I'm, I'm trying to, I was trying to be an example for our staff to do it every meal. And so that's what I was doing. Every meal, I was just doing it one kid at a time, one kid at a time. And then the Lord really kind of spoke to my heart and was like, you could minister to all of these kids if you would train their leaders. And I was like, man, that's true. <laughs> you know, so I started, you know, just, I started casting a net and I threw it out there to my leadership. Like, Hey, I'm going to offer a training at night on my own time to just train leaders, anyone that's hungry. And I'm going to train them to do what I was doing. And so I feel like on a macro level, um, just throwing it out there. I think I've seen a lot of that this last four weeks where everyone's been stuck. They're throwing it out huge net on Eventbrite, on, uh, you know, group chats, like, hey, you know, I've been doing this, I'm working with this, you know, I've been ministry this long, and I have a heart to make disciples and reach youth. And I'm wanting to have a training event, or I'm, I'm wanting to have a connecting event or a social to create gospeling environments. You know, I want to, but I have found personally, that the big gathering type things, you know, normally they plan themselves, like those kids are already planning to do lots of those type things, you know, um, I, you know, obviously I love camp ministry or I wouldn't be doing it, you know, I've noticed, but at the end, what is our camp really, you know, it's like limited family fun that most people could have on their own. And then essentially a worship night, it's a worship night gathering, um, with time to process and talk after kids want to process and it, it takes kids a time to wind down their life and to get away and escape life. And so creating environments that are retreat oriented, you know, a few days, uh, a week and saying, Hey, I want to host a retreat and I want to talk to you about your life, about wasting your life about um, that's what I've noticed. Kids on a retreat, think about their life a whole lot differently. They're able to evaluate a whole lot easier than an adult. And they just, they'll just be honest. Like, yeah, you know what? I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know, and, and someone to come in and be like, give two years of your life overseas. Train, train with me every day for the next four years and then go two years to Indonesia. You know, like we need to create and be aggressive about those kind of pipelines now. Every kid I meet, that's what I say. Um, when I preach the gospel, I'll say, I wish any of you would give it all up and go overseas for two years. And you know what's crazy? I said that one time, I was bawling, crying. Um, these kids started laughing while I was talking about people perishing and I, my heart broke. And uh, I just started crying. And this kid came up to me after. He was the only kid to come up to me. And he said, I want you to know something. Some people weren't taking that serious in here, but I did. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I quit baseball right now. And I'm going to go be a missionary in India this summer. <laughs> That's what he said. So listen, so this kid disappeared. He quit baseball. And he did it. I was telling that story to another group of young people. And I didn't realize that he was back and he, that he was there. I was telling everyone that week about this kid that came up to me and said that, and he was there. And so <laughs> he comes in, he's like, yo, I did it. And his youth pastor was like, he really did. And I, I gave him the mic and he told about what he saw in India and the people he saw prayed to receive Christ. And who knows how many people he inspired from that, you know? And I, that was just a random comment I made at the end of a sermon that the Holy Spirit directed me to say, you know what I mean? And so I just feel like kids are under challenge. So I just look at kids and I'll be like, They'll tell me what they want to do with their life. And I'll say, you should give all that up and go do this. <laughs> and then they'll be like, wow. You know, like, so I just think no one's talking to them like that. And, yeah. and I'm sure Carter growing up, he might not even remember it. I promise you, Carter Cox, grandparents looked at him 
probably every day they were with him and said, you're going to be a great man of God one day. We pray for you all the time. You're going to be a great man of God. You're going to make a lot of disciples one day. You know, and I, I do that with my own children. I'll be like, you're going to be a great man of God one day. You're going to make many disciples one day. You're, you know, I've already told, told my daughter, I'm kicking you out of the house, day you turn 18. And, you know, just stuff like that. Like, just, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Do you know, I wanted to say something, but I wanted to mention one more thing to you. Um, you know, I, I've been around the E3 crowd, No Place Left. Uh, I am second. Uh, and I keep asking, who is doing No Place Left with kids? And I kept getting like blank stares. So I thank you so much that, that you're modeling for uh, the, the, the methods and the tools that we're all using in different contexts and seeing them reactive to kids. And I just feel like that is a huge area. Now, Janelle, why don't you, you wanted to share something. Well, I just thank you so much for saying make it hard uh, because I am a gospel now only because someone made it hard on me. Mm -hmm. Now, when I trust in Christ at 16, I went home and shared with my family. That was voluntary. No one told me how to share the gospel, but I just said the closest thing to what I had heard, you know, and um, my brother trusted in Christ. So that was a great encouragement, but I wasn't a regular gospeler till we started doing short-term trips. And I was like, oh my goodness, I got to do this every day in a foreign culture. How am I going to do it? I'm scared to death. And it was exactly what you talked about. How do you make it uh, a crunch time, you know, difficult for people. So it's either step up or don't do it at all, you know, because that's what made me into a gospeler is that I had to make the decision. And then once I've gotten there, I was actually too afraid to do it, but I did it anyway because people had paid for me to go, you know? So I've tried to think about how do you make it where it's that make or break kind of situation. I think that that makes people, it certainly made me. So you have any ideas on that for youth or, I mean, even children, what we're talking about is children haven't, gotten yet to um to teenage years yeah i i'll tell you what i i just never forget they just um in the apartments that i go to i we were trying again like i was saying i'm discipling these people that have never been discipled and they're like we want to be with you and i was like well being with me means i'm going to send you out with another person and you won't be with me <laughs> and so i started sending them out to do it and um, I'll never forget, I, wa I was watching this girl, and it was so funny. It'd be like a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old. And next thing I know, they were going house to house praying with people. And these kids that hadn't even trusted Christ yet, they were like, we're going around praying for people. And they would say, we want to come too, because they just have no one praying with them. And so next thing I know, Mimi, her name's Mimi, Demetria, and uh, she said, where do you want me to go? Like, there's no one to read the Bible with no one to do like a DBS with. And she had 10 kids with her. And I said, just do it with the 10 he sent. Not <laughs> like, you know, you have 10 walking around with you doing this. And I, I like on this level, I like the disciple making movement uh, world a little better. Just disciple them anyway, before they receive Christ, just, you know, she's showing them the pattern before they believe. And, uh, you know, I just thought it was incredible. And, and just like we went around at Christmas and sang carols and all those kids wanted to sing carols. And, you know, this place that had a lot of shootings has had less shootings. And, but for me, I made an epic mistake. I'll never forget it. I, I bought a box of donuts. I found that to be incredible, helpful in discipling kids. I bought a box of donuts, sat on a bench and they'd all come. And, you know, and they started asking me, do we have to listen to the Bible story to get the donut? And I didn't want to make it transactional like that. I said, if you want to get a donut and leave just do it <laughs> but go quickly <laughs> you know and so i just remember this girl took a donut and left and uh that same girl threatened to like punch my daughter she was like three three years older and um i think i just didn't i was a little annoyed by that girl if that makes sense i'm just a little annoyed and i was like you know she's far from god anyway and, you know a month later she was shot and killed wow. and uh wow. i just thought really had an incredible amount of guilt to be honest with you um and regret and and i just i felt like you know what share with all of them 
<laughs> you know, you just don't know, you know, like it's just, and that's why I think I, I said this to Carter the other day. I don't think Romans 15 is the best no place left verse. I think second Peter three is, you know, just tell everybody. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to tell everyone this story. And um, the kids are totally worth. And here's the thing I started realizing the disciples, right? They had to feel like great practitioners. They're casting out demons. They're with Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, and here they were refusing the little kids to be near him. And I don't think we should make that mistake because Jesus basically says, this is a mistake. This is a mistake to refuse the children. And so he's just been speaking to me about that. And, and just, you know, don't refuse, you know, like I've been like, I don't want to win all these kids. I want to win whole houses. And he's just essentially sent me a bunch of kids, you know, but you know, it's just kind of, but maybe that's how he's going to have us win houses, you know? Yeah, one of our first uh, apartments that we worked in, um, we started with our intention of winning the apartment complex. We probably got about 10 adults, uh, and then we raised up a couple leaders to help us, and they were working with the adults. The adults kind of went down in numbers to like five or six, and then it ended up being these group of kids, and the kids would gather, but no adult would even open up their house to them. Uh, and so we sat on the, the concrete and we had like 25 kids. Um, and it was uh, just the receptivity of the kids was there when the adults wasn't. and Willing uh, to share the gospel. And yeah. And so, you know, we, we've seen bits and pieces mm -hmm. of short term success. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and we're praying that God could lay some foundations uh, because I just see youth pastors and you know guys that did what i did with youth for christ which were really good at event-based ministry I, I used to do that really well uh and then you know what really matters are the the few that i really concentrated on disciples they're now in full-time ministry doing everything you know i've got contacts all around the world of people that used to be in our youth gatherings through youth for christ um, but they were the youth and they, they were the ones that were the green lights. And it's so easy. And see, so, so many youth pastors are still looking for the numbers, um, you know, and, and the ego that it comes with uh, building a youth program that, that uh, you, you lift up to others and they kind of go, gee, I wish I had a, you know, a program like yours. But I know that we're really last, but youth pastors are missing the point of, just pouring your life into a few that can reproduce the one, three, nine, you know, those student leaders, every one of our kids that we still stay in contact with over the years was a student leader with us at one point. And those are the ones that lasted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've noticed that it's really hard to change the wine skin. And I think the, the youth pastors, they know that people, the dad is in, they know that they're losing. What, I, what I've started telling them is you should look every parent in the face and say, I have about a 20% success rate without your help. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, just be like, wow, you know, like just, and, and try to get them to have training environments with their parents and just constantly, that's my one thing I'm asking, like train them, offer service opportunity with the parents, offer to train. Um, I like what, uh, I forget his name. I think it's something Robbie Christmas from Florida. He says they tricked their whole church. They put their whole church in three groups, you know, hospitality team, harvest team, and help team. And they trained all of them to share the gospel. <laughs> and they said, if you do hospitality, share the gospel there. If you help someone, share the gospel. If you're in the harvest, obviously share the gospel. So he said, we just tricked everyone and put them on an H team. And just, we, we tell them they're on a new team every four months. You're on, <laughs> you're on this new team now. And so I think, um, but I, but I think what I found, just like you said earlier, I think short-term mission trips are great for casting vision. Kids will do them. They'll go on them. That's the bottom line. They'll, they'll, they'll go on them. They'll do them. And uh, I think casting vision there for walking it out when they get back in an apartment, in a neighborhood, in their school. Um, I, I tell every club that I minister to, you know, the schools around here, I say, if you have your yearbook, you know what it takes to reach no person left here. If you have a yearbook, you know, and just split it up and go for it. And it, even just now they're starting to like, hey, we could actually do that. You know what I mean? Like, and I think it just needs constant encouragement and constant 
motivation and then honestly a good telling of the stories you know what i mean like i told a story the other day of, i said my buddy carter seminary grad went to a training didn't think any of this would work didn't even follow the training shared with a muslim man at a cart the dude stopped the cart started smoking a cigarette prayed to receive christ and then essentially carter has been ruined ever since i told that story right and really? i probably made up i probably made up parts of it but i, I was like <laughs> and a bunch of his family but i just tell stories like that i I constantly vision cast the story of the people that have been just changed. And, um, and what's crazy is I, there's so many stories. I totally sympathize with the disciples that they didn't write them all down. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's so many stories now of just people winning so many people, you know, like, and it's just, and just attempting so many people. It's, you know, I think when I totally get now, when Jesus comes back, it'll catch us all by surprise. Because people are being faithful and we don't even know about it and crossing boundaries and cultures and having dreams of Jesus, you know, it's just going to happen. We will all be like, man, we've got a lot left to do and Jesus will have done it, you know? And so, um, but anyway, I do think the next generation, the one that's with us alive right now, these young people right now, I, I believe that we see the return. I believe that in my heart and I think they'll do it. Well, let's be part of the generation that equips them and launches them and in models for them, you know, and, and for me, I've always had a person live in my house the last four years. I think that's a great way. I think the way Jacob Vide discipled people in Haiti was a great way to do it. Um, it's 12 Haitian men. I don't know. Most wives would do that, but <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe, uh, one person, you know, I, I had one old youth group guy live with me. You know, I had my alcoholic cousin, Mike, listen to this. Carter Cox was with me and Hannah. I was crying about my family, praying over my oikos. And then it like hit me. I should try. <laughs> I should now try for that list. Right. I mean, now that I've poured my, I finally got like, I felt like I got God's attention. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but I, I feel that way sometimes. Like if, if my heart's broken, I feel like I got his attention. And, um, and so then I felt like I needed to try. And then come six months later, the night I called him to share the gospel, he said, I almost committed suicide tonight. I just wrote my letter. I can't believe you called me. And he yeah. prays to receive Christ with me. Wow. He relapses seven months later. And now he's in full. We lose him. Sounds like we lost you there. Internet fre freezing again, I think. Uh, you may be able to hear us, but uh, we've lost lost you for the moment. Hey, I just wanted to encourage you, John, Janelle. Um, is it? Am I saying that right, Janelle? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to. Our name means the same. That'll help you to remember. Yeah. It, and John and Janelle means God's gracious gift. Okay. So what a blessing. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish, wrap that up. My 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 cousin Mike, he lived with us saw everything we were doing, simple church. I baptized him in my bathtub. He relapsed, got clean again. He's been clean like eight months. And now he's in charge of a addiction home. And he called me. He said, Josh, who would have thought I'd be in ministry now? <laughs> <laughs> I never, I had no, I didn't even think to ask for that. I just wanted him to be receptive to the gospel. And here I had shot it way short. Now he shares the gospel. Listen to this. During COVID, he told me he was going out to feed people and share the gospel door to door. And he said, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm safe. I was, like, dude, I was like, dude, I don't even know if I'm doing that. <laughs> like, he goes, dude, I'm covered. But there's, you can't stop a radical person. You can't. He, no. nothing, nothing could stop him. So he's the best person to share. <laughs> you know, like, you know, well, thank you all for your encouragement today. I think you've been a huge blessing because uh, we've been going to these refugees uh, we about a year, I guess. And, um, you know, the whole family is trusted in Christ, but awesome. only Alex is the super interested. The other ones are younger and there's one older, but she's not interested. And we've been longing to find interpreters for the parents. Now, his mom trusts in Christ, but we haven't been able to share with the parents because they're either Afghans 
are their Congolese and that's Kenya Rwanda and, and we don't know how to speak Farsi or Kenya Rwanda and we can't find any interpreters. So we've been looking for a year and praying for you. Lord help us find these interpreters and you know what? We're just going to go ahead with the kids. <laughs> I mean, we have kids that will come and some of them are going to be, I just want a donut and run kids. There's plenty of them. But I guess we've held back because we thought these Afghani kids, um, their dads are not around at all. And we're trying to ask their mom, is it okay with you meet with your kids and they don't understand well enough? And they'll say, uh, well, let me ask their dad. But then, you know, we never get the answer. So uh, there's just, there's an area where we can sit and talk with the kids with some, um, I, I do have a quick question you know, with you about the Afghani. Are, are, do y'all have some some story sets in in Dari in Farsi with audio Bible and stuff? No, okay, you, ha you have to download this app. Okay, it's called the Discover Bible app, and um, it has Dari on there, which is the Afghani language. So it's like Farsi, but there's a little bit difference. But it's it's actually Afghan. Yeah, most most Afghans speak Dari or they speak uh, Pashtun. Uh, there's also a website that has the same exact thing. It's called, um, let me, I'm going to type it in the, uh, in the text here. But what's cool is they have all the story sets. They have the creation of Christ story set. They have the, um, the stories of hope. They have the, uh, but they have them in English and they have them in these other languages. Um, Dari and Farsi and a bunch of Somali um, but they also have the audio version and you can either go on that website or you can go uh, down the, the discover app on your phone um, but you can you can switch back and forth real easily between English and that story so you'll know what story they're actually um, seeing and they can play it so even if they can't read there's the audio version but that'll be really helpful for y'all. Um, you know if they that have that in Kyrie. Do they have it in Kyrie and Wanda as well for Congolese? Can you Wanda? Kyrie and Wanda for Congolese. Is that the same as Lingala? No. It's okay, no. a sort of a dialect of Swahili, but not all of, we've gathered the adults and we found out the interpretation we were having wasn't reaching the vast majority of and we've them. got a Kyrian Wanda downloadable Bible uh, but okay. the, but okay. we don't have the stories or audio which would be even better I don't I don't I don't have a, they don't have that on there um, I do now you you guys said you're working in Uganda yeah yes okay so there's a guy that we just took through our um, 10 week word works wineskins. He was formerly a prosperity gospel guy who came to Dubai to make a bunch of money planning a prosperity gospel church. Uh, but he got discipled by some movements people. And then he jumped on the zoom, but he, he's stuck in Dubai right now, but his plan is to go back to Uganda and he is totally messed up for movements. Um, and he's got the four fields under his belt and the church circle. And uh, he's already sharing the gospel over zoom and stuff. He might speak that language. Um, but I'd love to connect to you. His name is Joel Kim. And, uh, but he's, he's just bleeding for all of these. He says, I know all of these villages in Uganda that don't have any churches. We, and, we've got um, some pretty good partners in Uganda that have the tools. So okay. if you want to connect us, there may be a, uh, we've got probably maybe a dozen good uh, movement leaders now. Uh, quite a few okay. multi multipliers now probably 30 or 40 multipliers. Uh, and so uh, he could get in a context with some of our uh, multipliers, you know, and movement leaders, then he'd be in a good context of practitioners right away. Oh, that'd be great. That would be great. He, he, we work, worked through the gospels and acts and uh, we, we just finished actually yesterday. And he was crying on the Zoom call. He's like, this is the first time I've ever read the book of Acts. And, oh. you know, we, we did the study of the four fields and the church circle through the whole book of Acts. Yeah. And he was weeping. He was like, this is so simple. We just have to follow what Jesus did. We just have to follow what the, what the disciples did. 
He's actually, if you watch the No Place Left Summit tomorrow, uh, Dave recorded a testimony about him, and he'll, uh, he'll, he has a pre-recorded testimony. The dude is on fire, and I, I would love to hook you up with him. So. That would be great. Yeah, it would be op open if he's still around, too, if you want to do a three-way Zoom call sometime with yeah. him. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Happy, and then we could uh, find out if, you know, what city and what, what language group he is in uh and because we can be able to contact our leaders and actually if he's flying back in through Entebbe we've got leaders in Entebbe and in Kampala he'd be traveling through probably open their home up for a day uh and uh, build some rapport as he's getting connected back to his family so, awesome and this yeah, is awesome. a perfect time for him to get in with the Ugandan men and ladies that they're they've just been going through trial by fire uh, they've been locked into their houses yeah. and no food and yeah, starving uh, right now. Starving. It's, it's uh, they told us right in the beginning when, in their lockdown that uh, first they thought they would die in their homes from COVID-19. And then they realized they just may die in their homes from starvation because they don't wow. have food. So relief has been going to them. The Lord has been providing and uh, a lot of people have been getting on board, seeing their situation but they have not given up on being able to be light in a dark place. They had all their churches shut down and then threatened to be uh, taken to jail if people met. So they have, their house churches have flourished like crazy. No one has stopped them from doing house church. Come so on. they're like underneath the radar somehow. So they're just going like gangbusters. We're so excited for them. Let me, let me share one idea with you guys before we uh, let you go, because I know you probably need to go as well. Um, one of the things that with uh, E3 Partners, all the, all the international teams are shut down for the summer to, to going. Uh, we're trial, uh, we're kind of one of the trial balloons to do a, a virtual trip. Uh, and I've got a team from a church, and they were a discipleship school uh, that's going to that jump on and do a virtual trip. What that would look like is we train them with gospel conversations, and then each night uh, they they have uh, they'll, they'll do contact with uh, with our uh, Kiramajong people uh, and the churches. So they're actually they'll pay like two hundred dollars, and that two hundred will go over there to launch our guys to the Kiramajong. And then while we're training them with gospel conversations and outreach locally with Oikos, they'll get a report of what the churches are doing with the same training in, in Uganda, which wow. will spark them. That's uh, awesome. I was thinking that, that great could, idea. Josh was talking about retreat. We could actually do that. If you already have a, a youth group that is going on mission in the past and can't go this summer, we could do a weekend uh, send some of our guys to do a gospel conversations. Uh, and then we could do that type of training with a group there, tie in our guys in the evening uh, mm -hmm. from Uganda with video or Zoom uh, that may touch a, a youth group. You know, at this stage, we haven't mobilized, but you may already know somebody that was mobilized for mission and just has no place to go as a uh, high school student or college student. As we may it's be able to, it's a lot of people. That. There's so yeah. many people Antioch, in that. Antioch has shut down all theirs too. You know the Antioch Church. Yeah. Uh, what were you saying, churches. Josh? Go ahead. I, I was to affirm your idea. There's so many trips are canceled. It's it's really yeah. hard to fathom. I mean, all of them. You know, any yeah. group that was on a mission, all of them are kind of kind of scrambling for like local projects. But you know, obviously can't. So that's why um, the taste of going somewhere, I think, is a, a really great idea. Well, you know, I, the bandwidth to do too many new things all at the same time is probably limited. So what I'd love to do is instead of spending a lot of time recruiting and trying to find those churches, if you guys in your bandwidth have one that, that you have a good relationship with, um, we could do a Zoom call with them and see – because uh, we already have that, already got the price range with our Kiramajong people. Uh, I've got a 10-member team that's going to go like the 1st of July there for the week to do the work. So we've already have yeah. it set up. 
and they're going to, and two of the guys are pretty good with tech and be able to film and connect with us each evening as, you know, and we basically do it through Zoom so we could do it locally anywhere with the youth group. Uh, so let me know if they're, you know, as you pray about it, there's a good bandwidth for that. We could jump on it during May and, and have it have it well planned for a, a youth outreach in July then. It's a hard to awesome. reach tribe too. So uh, there's some excitement in reaching that tribe because they've been very closed and hostile uh, and they're more open right now. So what a blessing. Yeah. Well, thanks for staying on longer with us and just letting yeah, us please. shoot a lot of ideas with you and get feedback from you guys. You yeah, I, don't, I don't I don't know who who guy McGoofin is on here but maybe he's he's hearing some stuff. <laughs> Hello guy McGoofin. Hey guy McGoofin. Where are you guy? <laughs> we want to hear from you. You've been uh, a blessing to us. Really so that was that was like Jeff or someone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, he he's gone now. Off. He just jumped <laughs> off. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, man. No, yeah, y'all are such a blessing. I, I One last thing I'd encourage y'all is don't underestimate, you know, the y'all using your home. You know, I know a lot of these youth pastors and even volunteers for YFC and Young Life and everything. They Even them, they have not seen a, um, a together family unit, uh, they, uh, a husband and wife that has been married for a long time and on mission together. So y'all are a gym, a rarity where you're at. So uh, even if it's a residency and a part of the residency is come over to our house and have dinner with us once a night or uh, once a week, you know, let us, you know, I, I think, uh, man, y'all have all the authority in the world to speak on that because it's so rare nowadays to see um, a couple who has persevered not only in marriage, but in the faith and making disciples, uh, not only here in the neighborhoods, but in the nation. So um, I know that was something that you was know, at Robert Kennedy was at the master plan of evangelism. Is Robert that right? Coleman. Robert, Robert Coleman. Coleman. Robert Coleman, man, he did that like a master. <laughs> Constantly having families, a couple, he would have them over to his house, you know. So some of these younger married couples, uh, youth pastors, younger married without kids, younger married uh, couple that's with wives, he find them and be like, hey, you know, why don't you come over and let us cook you dinner? And and then you know, slip the three thirds in there. How are y'all doing? <laughs> When's the last time you shared the gospel? Let me tell you a story from the Bible. What'd you learn about God? You know, slip that in there. Just let them see it, man. Y'all, y'all can, y'all can do that. Bring, bring them onto your turf and uh, see who bites. Cause ultimately if you can model, if you can model a healthy home and a healthy marriage, you're going to far outlive yourselves uh, when it comes to reproducing disciples. Cause that's a huge yeah, barrier. We, we, hit, I, uh, I we hit 40 years this year. Come yes. on, Jesus. But, yeah. So, <laughs> Hey, bless you guys. We'll sign off now. You've been a real help to us. Thank you so much. It's great being with you. Love you. Bless you. Hey. Hey. Man, I had some serious Wi-Fi hookups. Hook it's a spiritual warfare, bro. Dang. Yeah, you had a good group, man. Yeah, I'll say it was a decent size. Yeah, man, that was good. It's about... Uh, the, the largest one I've seen so far was the UUPG one, which was like 60. What'd they say? Um, I need to listen to it. That's re that was record. Oh, what do I do now? Now that uh, I'm done. Just, oh, yeah, yeah. You just hit end recording. Stop recording.